Hey guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. Today I have a craft time mystery story for you. And while I'm doing that, I thought maybe I would make a little pendant book. Book pendant, pendant book, you know, something like that. Sound good? Today's story takes us all the way across the pond to the UK. I've never told a story from anywhere else but the States yet, so I guess it's time to pick on you guys. Maybe some of my UK friends have heard about this one before. It didn't happen too long ago, about five years ago, so maybe you have heard of it. Martin Cavanaugh's friends were probably really surprised when he fell for Sophie Wickers. It was a young woman that he met at the local pub. Cavanaugh was a man's man, if you want to put it that way. He enjoyed watching football and drinking and, well, that was... That was pretty much it. He liked to go to the pub and he liked to watch football. Oh, and he liked to go to the gym. Martin was born and raised in Croydon and never seemed to be mm, like the settling down type. Sophie was also from Croydon. She was a very happy, fun-loving person. Her friends remember that in school they wouldn't be allowed to sit together because they would just end up giggling through class. So, you know, relatable, right? She had a huge circle of friends and loved a good night out. Even though she grew up in a less than desirable area, as it was described, Sophie had big dreams of what she was going to do with her life. She had serious ambitions to make it big, open up her own beauty therapy salon, and then branch out and have like lots of them all across London. This was really different from how Martin lived his life. He really didn't have any ambitions and, I mean, no discernible source of income whatsoever. Basically, he spent his time supporting Arsenal and drinking and going to the gym. So it was a little surprising that, you know, they clicked, but obviously there was some kind of chemistry because they ended up getting married in 2011. Martin was 29 and Sophie was 24. And they had this huge fairy tale white wedding. Sophie looked beautiful. But if the white wedding hinted at their aspirations for life together, reality of their existence was not so much. At first, they moved into his mother's flat. And then a little bit after that, they were able to get their own place which was a little flat above a Skoda garage. Not exactly the ideal location, but Sophie was determined to make it comfortable for herself and for Martin. She found herself a job as a part-time cleaner in the Bromley area, and the whole idea of this job was so that Sophie could save some money and get started on building her dream, her beauty therapy salon. And she would work as many hours as she could and take on as many jobs as she was offered to make that possible. Meanwhile, Martin was, um, well, he was drinking and he was going to the pub and he liked going to the gym. So status quo there. Not long after they got married, Martin got this huge tattoo across his chest. One of the psychologists, uh, Professor Jane Moncton Smith, said that the statement tattoo wasn't just about him letting the world know how much he loved Sophie, but more like that Sophie belonged to him, that it was like a possession issue. To say on a tattoo that you don't have a life without your partner kind of gives us some insight into some of the anxieties he had about the way he thought relationships would be, how their relationship would be. And so their relationship would have been dominated by his anxieties about their relationship possibly ever ending. He ended up being very domineering, kind of in a way that he wanted to trap Sophie in the relationship so that he could feel okay and so that he felt stable. While he definitely loved Sophie, and I'll put those in air quotes, it was more like a jealous love, kind of like a possessive love. And it shows that he was never prepared for their relationship to ever come to an end. So paranoid was Martin about the possibility that Sophie could leave him that he began to track her every move. If she was to go out with friends without him, 
he would just start calling her incessantly. He was the kind of person who has a very short fuse. Typical road rager. Kind of guy who, if there's somebody looking at him, you know, the wrong way, he's going to start a fight. He's definitely a bully. And Sophie wasn't into that. She did not appreciate that possessive controlling behavior. She wanted an enjoyable, stress-free life. So it's no surprise that it didn't take very long and Sophie was miserable. And she started hinting that she wanted out of the marriage. They would even go on to separate more than once. But in the end, their relationship came crashing down within only six years. I mean, it's not surprising. Martin being such a bully, being incredibly jealous and controlling. And when you're with somebody like that, it's exhausting. You're constantly walking on eggshells, just waiting for the next interrogation, the next argument. The world that Martin Cavanaugh said was his everything, his reason for living, was slipping away. And it was all his fault, even if he could never see that. This put Sophie in a dangerous place because Martin was beginning to panic. If he couldn't have his wife, then nobody would. It was on Boxing Day in 2016 that Sophie told Martin that their marriage was over. She left and she went back to Croydon and got herself her own flat. Martin soon followed. He didn't move to Croydon, but he moved into a one-bedroom flat on Chatterton Road in Bromley, which is about only seven miles from Croydon. So basically too close for comfort. And even though Sophie had ended things with Martin, she would still involve him in her life. She was the quintessential peacemaker. She didn't want any arguments. She didn't want any bad blood. So when he would ask her to meet up with him, she would agree just to placate him. Of course, his reasoning on this is that he's in denial that the marriage is ending and he's just trying to keep a connection with Sophie. She's just trying to keep peace and hopefully end this all amicably and be friends, but he can't move on. He can't let her go. And so by continuing to contact her, then this probably like helped keep his panic at a lower level because he felt like there was still this connection while she's just hoping, you know what, we'll be friends, we'll go out and have drinks every once in a while. And I'm sure she was hoping that he would just meet somebody else and his life would be busy and he would be focused on someone else. And then maybe the break would be easier. But that never seemed to happen. He wasn't finding anybody else. And when Sophie filled out divorce papers and then asked Martin to sign them, there was no doubt at this point that she really wanted out. She wanted to move on with her life and not with him. But he refused to sign the papers. He couldn't accept that his wife, his possession, no longer wanted to be with him. And by saying no, he could retain a measure of power over her because then she's tied to him. She can't move on in a lot of ways. Like she could never get married until he divorces her first. And then he would look for other ways to keep them connected, keep them tied together. So she didn't have a car available to her at the time. So he offered that she could use his, but then he used that offer to control her. So if she needed to get the car to go to a cleaning job, and she would make arrangements with him to use the car, he would drop off the car, but then forget to leave the keys. Or he just simply refused to bring the car to her, just to frustrate her life. Things became even worse when Sophie decided that she wanted to start dating again. She wanted to meet new people, and she started up an online dating profile. Martin found out about this, and according to the prosecutor, it was because he had somehow gotten her passwords and had hacked into her account, and he'd find a way to contact the people that she was making dates with and call or text them and frighten them off because Martin's a big bad man bully. So he's thinking in his head, you know, how do I keep this relationship together? How do I get her back? Well, Martin, this wasn't the way to do it. 
But in a state of panic, his controlling behavior is just snowballing. And he starts full out stalking her. Even though he's on the outside of the relationship, in his head, he's still in it because they're still married. He's following her and surveilling her and seeing who she's meeting as if he had a say in what she did or how she lived her life. One night in February 2018, Martin took drastic action when his efforts to ruin Sophie's date didn't work. She had made him really jealous when she mentioned that she had to run because she had a date. When he tried to call her later, he became enraged that she wouldn't pick up, knowing that she was with another guy. So he started bombarding her with texts. When she didn't respond, he started pestering their mutual friends, trying to find out exactly where she was. He even left a series of voicemails for a friend as he tried to persuade the friend to tell him where Sophie was, but the guy didn't know where she was. Martin was also apparently in his car, driving around searching for Sophie and then waited outside her mom's house. He told the friend that he didn't know what he was going to do if he found her. When he failed to find Sophie and he went home, he made a video call to another friend and the friend said that Martin picked up a knife and held it against his own neck. And then the friend said he could see a stream of red coming from his skin and then Martin collapses out of sight. So the friend calls the police because he's thinking Martin's hurting himself. But when they get to Martin's house, he wasn't hurt at all. It was just a manipulative, desperate ploy to see if Sophie could be scared into contacting him. Like the coward that he is. I'm like, wow, dude. Wow. You can start to see the kind of person that Martin is. He's very insecure, but also very narcissistic because he's not going to actually hurt himself. You know, what a jerk. After months of begging and threatening and stalking and bullying Sophie, and it just didn't work, later that year in May, he tried a new tactic. Martin sent Sophie a ton of WhatsApp messages mostly rambling where he was accusing her of breaking him and saying other really, really unpleasant things. And she completely ignores him. And what made him even more angry was that Sophie refused to see him that night. So Martin was drowning his sorrows, you know, at the pub, his second home with friends. When I was researching this and it was talking about him drowning his sorrows in the pub with friends, I'm thinking... This guy had friends? <laughs> I'm like, who would put up with this guy? Um, that night, he drank and drank and drank and may have even been taking some of the um, devil's powder, if you know what I mean. And he sent her another message and it started out with, it's going to sound strange, but you've stripped for money for peanuts online. So just context, apparently either he'd been told she was stripping online, which wasn't true, or he just made it up to bait her to see if she'd you know, respond. And then he continues, you have broken, shattered, destroyed, ripped me to shreds. So I want you to sleep with me one final time. It's all I think about. Then he says, get this, hold on to your butts. He has a hundred pounds he would pay her if she'd sleep with him. Class act there, Martin. Such a ladies' man. <laughs> Sophie was disgusted with this and just refused him flat. This backfired on Martin because now she's even trying to put more distance between them. But it seems like he knew just what to say to reel her back in. Later on that month, it was May 18th, which was a Friday, Martin uh, called Sophie and told her this big old sob story. He says that he's about to be arrested because uh, one of his fingerprints was found on a watch that was being pawned and the watch had been stolen. So he said he's going to be arrested for his part in a jewelry robbery and that he's facing eight to 12 months. So in his head, he's probably thinking, because this wasn't true, but in his head, he's thinking, I'm gonna give her this one last chance to change her mind 
because I'm such a nice guy and because I love her, I'm going to give her this last chance to come back to me and be with me and save her own life. I mean, after he had asked her to sleep with him for money, their relationship was like at an all time low. Even he could realize that. So he needed to come up with something pretty spectacular in order to manipulate her to spend the day with him. And maybe he thought that this dramatic scenario would finally win her back. Honestly, he seems delusional enough to think it might work. Because, I mean, obviously he had to realize that at some point she was going to find out that it wasn't true. I mean, right? But he's thinking, you know, I'm just such a Casanova that if she just spends some time with me, that she won't be able to resist me. And then she won't care that I lied. And bless her heart. Sophie agreed to spend the day with him. For her viewpoint, she's probably thinking, you know what, he's going to be arrested and going away to jail for a while. And she thought, I'll just placate him and get him off my back. So the next day, they went to Wingham Wildlife Park, which is near Canterbury. And there is CCTV footage showing them having a nice day out. Then they go meet with friends at a pub and have drinks in the garden. After that, they returned to Martin's flat. And to Martin, I'm sure it was just like the good old days. And he's probably deluding himself that he was actually winning her back and that things were beginning to get back on track between them. But he was wrong. She was really done with him. What exactly happens next may never really be known. They appear to have spent some time just hanging out. Um, some neighbors would later report that they were walking their dog and heard a scream that they thought sounded like someone in real distress that evening. Only the following morning did Martin and Sophie's families begin to get an inkling that something was wrong. At 10 past 8 that morning, Martin goes to his mother's house, clearly in a state. He tells his mom that he has to go to the police station, but then he leaves and doesn't make clear exactly where he's going. So all this day, his mom is trying to get a hold of him to find out where he is, sending him messages, trying to call but he never answers her. So she ends up contacting a couple of friends and asks if they would go and look for him at his flat. The friends that Sophie and Martin were with the day before at the pub go over to Martin's house to look for him. When they get there, they look through the window because nobody was answering the door and they see Sophie's handbag which is weird because Sophie doesn't live there. Martin's mom gave them the key so that they could get in and check it out. And when they returned, they found that their friend, 31-year-old Sophie Wickers, lying motionless under the duvet in the bedroom. And Martin, the last person seen with her, was nowhere to be found. So, of course, now the police are searching for Martin because the friends immediately contacted the police. He is the only suspect and he has gone on a runner. But it seems he didn't have much of an escape plan because a few days later on the 23rd of May, Martin was found by his family hiding in the garden shed and they took him to the Bromley police station where he gave himself up. As they were booking him in, Martin made a comment to an officer that he wouldn't hurt a fly. He even tried to do CPR on Sophie but had to stop because her nose started to bleed. So now he's denying that he murdered Sophie? Is he implying that he just found her already lifeless and then tried to help her? Well, those are very good questions. Custody officers were emptying his pockets and found three of Sophie's bank cards. But when questioned, he gave no explanation. Matter of fact, when he was formally interviewed, he elected to make no comment. And with that, he was charged and remanded into custody. In December of that year, Martin goes on trial for murdering his wife. At court, Martin maintained that yes, he had grabbed Sophie around the neck, but that he'd let go. And he certainly didn't strangle her to the point of suffocation. Martin claims, in fact, that he acted in self-defense. He said that they'd been drinking and using some drugs and went on to have a, quote, in-depth, 
very nice conversation about their relationship over the years, what had gone wrong, and what they had done to one another, which had exacerbated their relationship difficulties. I just rolled my eyes at this point because I'm thinking, one, I can't imagine him being that articulate, and two, I can't imagine this bozo having a very nice or in-depth conversation about anything with anyone ever. So in the context of this heart-to-heart conversation that he says they had, he fessed up and told her he lied about the robbery and that he was not, in fact, going to be charged with burglary. He said that's when Sophie got irate and attacked him. Martin said that he restrained her and described having held her back by his hand to her neck for a short period of time. But he said there were no ill effects In fact, she kneed him in the groin and that caused him to take his hand down. And then she walked off down the hallway. I don't know if he or his attorneys thought of this, but what a steaming pile of, um, I don't think so. Martin told the court that Sophie had talked about taking some sleeping tablets and that he heard a crash in the hallway. So maybe she banged her head. What makes his not guilty plea even more bizarre is that when Sophie's body was discovered, there was a note and it was unmistakably written by Martin because Martin was, according to barrister Tony Kent, at best illiterate. It was written in what could almost be described as badly spelled text speak, but it basically said that he had killed Sophie and that she deserved it. Throughout the trial, though, Martin would continue to maintain his innocence. On the 10th of December, the verdict was returned. The jury says that Martin was guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 16 years to be served. Hold up. Okay, UK. What the heck? Please correct me if I'm wrong, those of you in the UK, but this is how I understand it. It's life in prison, but the minimum of 16 years means that he will be eligible to be paroled in 16 years. Like, that's going to happen. Now, whether or not he gets paroled or not is up to the parole board, right? But literally, he only has to serve 16 years and then the parole process starts. So, wow, wow, is that all a person's life is worth nowadays? I mean, I'm not here to make laws or change laws, but I'm just saying, wow. Okay, I'm going to get off this soapbox because it's just making me angry. (laughs) Yeah. And what makes it even worse was that It's not like this was a crime of passion, like he just lost control, all of a sudden just, you know, blew up. Martin was clearly a very jealous person and couldn't accept that Sophie wanted to move on with her life. And while it's likely that both alcohol and drugs could exacerbate any feelings of paranoia or jealousy, he had been working really hard to manipulate Sophie and had been devising a plan for months. This was not spur of the moment. He knew exactly what he was doing. There were numerous opportunities for him to come to his senses and realize that he's going off the deep end. But then that's not what malignant narcissists do, is it? Everything he did was for his own sake, to make him feel better. Because how dare she want to leave him? Woe is me. What will become of me? Blah, blah, blah. What a man, baby. What cemented it for me was the fact that after he killed his innocent wife, he wasn't so distraught as to end his own life. No, he ran because he was scared what would happen, say it with me, to him. (laughs) You know, it's downright scary that the only reasonable conclusion he could muster was to commit murder because he couldn't go on peacefully with his life knowing that she was happy without him. It's just sad. When Sophie met Martin Cavanaugh, she was a young woman who was determined to succeed. She couldn't have known when she first met him how dangerous he was. When Martin's controlling and jealous behavior began to wear her down, Sophie decided to leave. But by then it was too late. And because of a childish, pathetic loser, this world was deprived of a kind, sweet girl who only wanted to live a happy and fulfilling life. 
Rest in peace, Sophie. Well, I hope you liked the little book pendant, pendant book, whatever. But that's all for this one. Thank you all for joining me and sticking it out because that was intense. And I hope anyone out there who might be in a controlling, even dangerous relationship seeks some help. I will leave some information below the video. The thought of breaking the silence and talking to somebody might be scary, but ultimately it's scarier if you don't. Please everybody be safe. Have a great weekend and I will see you all really, really soon in the next video. Bye guys.